Welcome to another episode of The Wormhole. I'm really excited about our guest today. He's all about nature. Can't wait to uh, have a chat with none other than Professor Floyd Hayes. Hello, Floyd. Howdy, howdy. Welcome. So who is Floyd Hayes? Floyd Hayes, PhD, is a zoologist specializing in the ecology, behavior, and biogeography of birds. He's a professor of biology at the Pacific Union College in California, United States <coughs> currently. While an undergraduate student, Professor Hayes took off a year to teach in an elementary school on the island of Corsray in Micronesia. He worked for three years as a vertebrate biologist for the U.S. Peace Corps based in the National Museum of Natural History of Paraguay. He also taught at the University of the Southern Caribbean and at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad and Tobago. He's a former colleague of mine. He spent a year working as a wildlife biologist for the Division of Fish and Wildlife in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. Professor Hayes was editor-in-chief of Journal of Caribbean Orthonology during 2005 to 2013 and was a Fulbright Scholar to Paraguay in 2012. He has published data from field research in 15 countries in North America, Central America, the Caribbean, South America, and Micronesia. He's also the author of several books, including The Field Guide to the Birds of Trinidad and Tobago. He tells me he began catching snakes at the age of eight. I pause for dramatic effect and began birding at the age of 12. So it's no surprise that he enjoys birding, rock climbing and snorkeling. Welcome, welcome Floyd to the wormhole, which allows us to connect with scholars and academics all around the world. So I, as you know, I'm in Trinidad and Tobago right now, and you are in California. So let's get started. I'm going to start off by asking you, did you always want to be a biologist? Does it go back to your childhood? Well, the first job I ever wanted was to be a garbage collector. Uh, we used to have these garbage trucks rolling down the road and there'd be a, a bunch of guys on the hanging on the back of it and they'd, they'd jump off and they'd have a, a big uh, sheet, a, a canvas sheet, and they would go into our backyard and they would dump the trash cans, uh, the, the contents of our trash cans in it. And they'd pick it up with four corners, carry it over their shoulders, walk to the truck and dump it in. So we used to, my brothers and I used to do that around the house, carrying you know trash, garbage around the house. But when I was in uh, probably first grade, that's when my dad first introduced us to snakes. I probably wanted to be a biologist ever since then. There were times I wanted to be um, an athlete, like in the Olympics or playing baseball or football. But um, um, that never really went very far. I pretty much wanted to be a biologist since I was a kid. Okay, so I can see that the passion was there, starting with the snakes and the bugs and so on, I would imagine in your yard, and that never seemed to have left you. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction that um, you are a former colleague of mine at the University of the West Indies. What brought you all the way to Trinidad? Uh, well, I was a PhD student in uh, Loma Linda University in Southern California, and one of my uh, fellow PhD students had interviewed for a job teaching at the Adventist College in Trinidad called Caribbean Union College, now University of the Southern Caribbean. And when he came back, he told me it was a beautiful place. And, and I said, hey, and, and he was going to accept the job offer. So I said, do you, do you need any other professors there? And he says, we're starting a new biology degree and we need to hire another professor. So if you're interested, we could uh, offer you a job. So they offered me a job and that's how I wound up going there in 1993. Wow, that's uh, very interesting how the uh, parts in our life take us in places we probably didn't imagine. I mentioned that you have been in, a, well, at least published from work from about 15 countries. Um, what are some of the most fascinating wildlife animals that you've come across? Well, my favorite animals would probably be those in, in East Africa. It took me 56 years to get there, but I've been there three times now and I'm heading there in a couple of weeks again. Um, you know, birds have been my forte and I love the tropical rainforest birds in South America, but I also like marine biology. And, uh, I think maybe the most interesting animal I've studied recently, there's a shrimp that lives in, in, uh, uh, 
there's a shrimp that lives in burrows in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. There's also ones in the Caribbean, but there's one that I found that was associating with a particular species of goby. And there's a number of these partnerships. And so I took some students there in 2019 on that little island in Fiji. And we set up cameras underwater and took some video. And I just submitted a paper for publication uh, a couple of months ago during Christmas break. But that, that was really uh, interesting to, to watch. The, the fish, um, uh, the, the shrimp basically cleans the burrow, maintains it, and the shrimp acts as a lookout. And it goes out in front of the, the burrow and looks around. If he sees any danger approaching, he retreats. And the shrimp pushes sand out. And it's, it's really fun watching all of that in the videos. Oh, that's really, really interesting. I mean, with my background in astronomy, I think that sort of beats what maybe stars <laughs> blowing up. <laughs> no, no, what, you're, you're, what you do is fascinating as well. <laughs> so that's really, really interesting. So, I mean, your career has been a bit of an adventure all over the world. Any misadventures? I spent, uh, I spent nine months teaching in this school in Micronesia, and I really enjoyed it. I, was, I turned 20 years when I was there. I lived without electricity, without hot water for nine months. And um, at one point, I was on a boat that was traveling from one island to another for three days, and the boat nearly sank. And uh, there was a piece of the uh, a ring that goes around the propeller shaft that had fallen out and the water was coming in. And I happened to have scuba gear on the boat with me. And so I wound up, they gave me a towel and I wound up swimming underneath to, to plug up the leak with the towel. And I only had like 300 pounds of pressure in my tank, which is, you know, you're supposed to stop at 500, but I stopped at 300 and I survived and the boat didn't sink. So that was a nice adventure. And then in Paraguay, I spent about, a month living with Native Americans near the Bolivian and Brazilian borders. I uh, took my wife there on my honeymoon. The first time I went up there, <laughs> that was crazy. And uh, I've had some good adventures um, um, that were unrelated to work. You want You'd to be happy those? to hear it, absolutely. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, some years ago, I was with a friend. We were trying to photograph a rare gull. We actually took some photos. We finally found it. And he weighed 60 pounds more than me. He was in the front of a canoe. Now I've canoed about 1500 miles on this big lake in Northern California where I studied these grebes for 10 years. I had funding for it, but this was in the middle of the winter. The water was very cold. It was 44 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what that would be Celsius, but cold middle of winter. And, and, and he was looking sideways. We were photographing it sideways. And then he leaned back to look in his camera at the photos and our canoe flipped over. So I, we spent a half hour swimming in the water uh, we got rescued by a guy in a kayak and then pulled out of the water by um, a commandeered fishing boat. We had severe hypothermia. We were in the hospital. We were shivering for about an hour before we stopped shivering. And um, I, I remember when they pulled, pulled us out, I couldn't walk. <laughs> we, were, we were lucky we, we survived that one. You said we have some very interesting stories. And, 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 then, and then a few years ago, I was up on, I climbed the Matterhorn in Switzerland. And we got caught on the summit in a snowstorm. And uh, we had to do 24 rappels in the snowstorm coming down steep, very steep, dangerous terrain. 10 people had already died on that mountain earlier in the year. And we, just before it got dark, we made it to an emergency hut where we spent the night shivering underneath blankets. And the hut saved our lives, basically. We knew it was there and that was our goal to make it there. And then the next day we had to climb down all the way down to the bottom, but we made it and survived. Wow, this is really, really interesting to hear these stories. And I can actually see the glint in your eyes, <laughs> Floyd, as you tell me. What's the next mountain are you thinking of? <laughs> next mountain? Uh, actually, my son and I were going to climb Kilimanjaro this summer. But he's been working in Ukraine the last nearly four years. And he, he fled Ukraine basically in January. But his, his savings are there, and he was going to pay for me to climb Kilimanjaro with him in, in Africa, and that's the highest point in Africa. Yeah. That's been his dream for several years, so uh, I'm not sure if we're going to make it. His money's all in the bank there, and he says he still wants to go, but that's still up in the air. But there's one other thing I enjoy doing is uh, diving with sharks. The, probably the best shark dive I had was with 30 bull sharks and three other species of sharks in Fiji. Wow, 
so I mean, suddenly bird watching is sounding very tame, Floyd. <laughs> so when you were in Trinidad, I mean, you did write the book, um, The Field uh, Guide to the Birds of Trinidad and Tobago, compared to some of these um, adventures that you've had all around the world, I must say. So I think Kilimanjaro will wait for you. I can say the mountain's not going anywhere. So you never know. Yeah, we, we, we may have to wait another year for that one. Okay, so that's really fascinating that you, despite all the academic work and so on that you do, which is of course connected with nature and the wilderness, that you get to enjoy this kind of adventure. So in your time in academia, um, what would you say, has there been any development that has been really changed the field? I mean, you see that kind of things like in say computer science or physics, but what about in uh, biology? For me, I would have to say it would be the development of digital photography and videos because it has been a lot of fun being able to take photos of organisms. So I, I, I use them in my biology lectures, but also for research. I mean, I have trail cameras uh, that are, you know, automated. I mean, they, they're motion activated and they take photos. You could also set them to take a photo every minute. And so I've, I've actually published, I think, uh, I think five research papers so far, just using trail cameras. Uh, they take a lot of time to analyze the photos because you get a lot of photos, but they take photos when you're not there. So you can get all kinds of, uh, you can study behavior of the animals that way. And same thing with videos, you know, like I, uh, uh, we have videos. I, I published a couple of articles just based on videos on animal behavior, including, uh, uh, well, I, I have one that, that I just submitted on the fish and goby interacting together. We put underwater cameras beside them on a tripod and took video so we could study them. And so that, that makes it fun. And I also use those for like lab exercises for animal behavior class. So, so I would say that that has been the best thing for me. That's indeed quite fascinating. And for well, most of us regular folks who comfortably enjoy nature through television documentaries, I mean, one has seen the huge difference in the type of stuff you had available maybe a couple of decades ago to what we have now. In our field, it's now really taking off in astrobiology, hoping to find life in other worlds. So it's remarkable to see how we can take the biology at its extreme levels on planet Earth. And who knows? Who knows? Maybe one day we'll find life out there. What do you think? Do you think I'm just randomly um, uh, bouncing off thoughts of you? Do you think there's life out there on the other worlds? I, I do. I would like to think that there is life out there. I mean, our universe is so vast and we know so little about it. I would like to believe that there is a creator that just simply enjoys creating life in different planets for the same reasons that we enjoy having creating children because we get to participate in creation in that degree. And, and we have children because we, we, we enjoy watching them grow up and, and having a family and it gives us pleasure. So uh, Floyd, I mean, you are a biologist and we briefly talked a little bit as to you getting into the career of biology along the way, did you have mentors and heroes, people who inspired you, defining moments, perhaps? Uh, yes, I did. My my dad used to take us snake hunting a lot. And so he took us on a lot of camping trips when I was growing up. And that really kind of moves me in the direction of my my career goals. And, and so he was a hero to me. Although he was not a biologist, he was a construction worker. He had too many kids to really go through school as, as much as he needed to be a biologist. And um, and then I had a next door neighbor who went to school with my my parents and he was a, a diehard bird watcher or birder. And uh, and so he got us into he was a mentor to me and my my twin brother when we began uh, birding. I do have a twin brother that looks a lot like me. I'm not sure if you are aware of that. Yes, and, I did. I did have <laughs> the Internet stalking. Um, so, yeah. so, so he was a, a very good mentor for us. Uh, he wasn't an ornithologist. Then when I was in, in Micronesia, uh, my brother sent me the, he met a guy on a, on a boat trip off the coast of Maryland who worked at the Smithsonian, the National Museum of Natural History. And he heard that, uh, he heard from my brother that I was in Micronesia and I was finding some new records of birds and I wanted to write a research paper. I'd never you know, done that before. And so, so he gave him my, his, he gave my brother his name and my brother passed it on to me. So when I returned to Maryland, 
I went to the Smithsonian and I met him. And the guy was just very nice to me. He really gave me a lot of encouragement. He says, here, this is what you need to do. Here's some literature for you. You know, go ahead and write your research paper and, and I'll help you. And I gave him a draft and it was terrible. And he tore it up and, and he says, you know, just, you got, you know, he, he edited it. And, and so he went through a few different drafts with me and just gave me a lot of encouragement. That was very helpful because I was just a college undergraduate, you know, and to have somebody that a scientist at the Smithsonian, you know, kind of mentoring me on how to write a research paper. That was a, that was a big, big uh, help for me. And then I had professors in college that were biologists and, uh, and so they were, they were mentors as well. Okay, one realizes the important role that other people around us play in our lives to actually take us on the trajectories that we end up on along the way. So in your path, in your career, and even, I mean, I actually see two very strongly developed aspects of you, the, um, I will call it Floyd the adventurer and Floyd the biologist. Did you have challenges in your career? Um, that, you know, at times it felt like, okay, I can't do this. Uh, not really. I just, I kind of dreamed big all my life and I had a lot of motivation and energy and, and uh, uh, yeah, when I was in college, I decided, uh, you know, we had a, a, a library and I was at a small undergraduate college or university, we just had undergraduate degrees. At least that's where I started. And I saw a few research journals there and I somehow decided I wanted to be a scholar and write research papers and that, that uh, motivated me, but I, I can't think of any real challenges in life. I, I, I consider myself very fortunate because I grew up in a middle-class American family and I had opportunities, a lot of opportunities that a lot of people just simply don't have in life. I had opportunities to travel and to go places, but I, I had to work to, to earn those and find those. So uh, um, it wasn't easy, but um, but things lined up in my life. And, and so uh, one of my goals was to to travel and visit different countries and live in different countries where I could do research and and uh, and learn about the, the the plants and animals that live there, mostly the animals. So. And you've certainly been able to do quite a bit of that. Did you find um, were there any countries where you had uh, challenges with languages or anything? Do you speak any other language? Well, I was I I took a, a couple Spanish classes, a couple quarters of Spanish before I went to the Galapagos Islands in 1984 when I was an undergraduate student. And I tried talking to the people there in Spanish and I only knew a few words and they go, blah, 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 and I couldn't understand anything. So I decided it was better not to talk, to talk to people. It was frustrating. And then I became a Peace Corps volunteer in Paraguay and we had to learn Spanish there. So I had Spanish classes there five days a week. And I was living for three months uh, uh, during when we were having our training with a Spanish family that spoke zero English. And then I met a young lady there who didn't speak any English and uh, wound up having a romance with her. <laughs> I, learned, I, learned, I learned Spanish pretty quickly with her. So oh, I, um, you, you had the motivation. <laughs> yes, yes, I was motivated to learn Spanish a little bit more then. But uh, yeah, so I learned Spanish pretty well. I, I actually go to a Spanish speaking church uh, quite regularly and so I get to, to practice. And my wife now speaks to me in English most of the time. But for a couple of years, that was always spoke was in Spanish, uh, which was pretty fun. I, I really like that. I, I know I learned some Portuguese and I've traveled to Brazil a bunch of times. Um, I've been to the Amazon region about five times, but uh, I've never, never really learned it well enough to be fluent in Portuguese. So I wish I could, but it, it takes a long time to learn that. So um, your children, are they bilingual with uh, both of you speaking my son English is, and English? My son is probably like octolingual. Ah. <laughs> he speaks like, I don't know, seven or eight languages. He lives, he's been living in East Europe. He speaks Arabic, French, German, Spanish, um, uh, Russian. He speaks Russian. He was speaking Russian every day in Ukraine. Uh, he learned a lot of Polish. Um so yeah, he's he's really into other languages. All right. So he certainly outdid you there. <laughs> yeah, I think he got it. I think he got it from his mother. My okay. my wife actually speaks a Native American language called Guarani. Most people in Paraguay oh. speak Guarani. Okay, that's really really fascinating. I, I never learned much of it, but my son actually learned a bunch of it, and so they actually talk to each other in Guarani sometimes. Ah, and they just glance at you, right? Just smiling. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, they're often joking about it because uh, there's some words that they use to joke about. 
<laughs> yeah, it's actually quite valuable sometimes to be um, have one more than one language <laughs> in your. Um, it is. It's nice. It's it's nice to know at least one other language, especially Spanish, since that's so widespread in in the Western Hemisphere here. Yes, absolutely, and especially us in the Caribbean, as you know. And and as a matter of fact, um, Spanish is playing more and more of a role in Trinidad and Tobago within the last decade or so. Good, good to hear that. Here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's been pretty good. So um, what about the Trinidad dialect? You got that down good, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I've never been able to speak Trini. Uh, okay. Actually, when I first came to Trinidad, um, I had the hardest time understanding you guys. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> I remember two guys uh, talking with each other and I was trying to like figure out which language, are they talking in English or some other language? And then in the classroom, uh, a student would raise his hand and ask a question. And I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? And, and he'd ask it again and I didn't quite get it. And then other students would start saying it at the same time. And, and I felt like an idiot. I mean, <laughs> and it took me, I was scared. You know, I was basically afraid of students asking questions in the classroom and hoping nobody would. It took me a few months to really kind of pick up on the, on, on being able to understand it well. It was just different enough when I first went there. I had a hard time understanding it. But I understand you perfectly now. I'm, I, in fact, it's nice to hear a Trini accent. I don't hear Trini <laughs> accents very often. Yeah, but my yeah. son, my son grew up speaking Trini with okay. a, a Trini accent. He would speak it in school, but at home he'd speak American English. But we'd hear him talking with his kids, just like, you know, Trini's. I doubt he I doubt he can do that anymore because he left when he was uh, he was probably nine years old when he left. Yeah. Don't be surprised, though, especially in childhood when children learn languages, it really sort of stays with them. Could be, could be. I, yeah. I should ask him. But my colleagues who come from abroad say this pretty much the same thing that you do, that even though we are speaking in dialect and it's in English, that it's very difficult for them to understand that um, Trinidadians speak very fast. <laughs> That's one of the complaints. Well, see, we have a lot to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, yeah, the dialect can be quite different. I remember, I remember a few things like uh, uh, one guy said, me not see she. And I had no clue what that person was talking about. And my wife somehow figured it out. I didn't see her, but, you know, me not see she. I'm like, what is that? And then um, I remember this one guy telling me how um, uh, he apologized for arriving late to my home. He says, uh, I bounced my car. And, uh-huh. uh, and I'm like, to me, bouncing is going up and down like that. And like, did you like drive off a, a, a wall or something, a cliff? He goes, no, no, somebody, you know. <laughs> Bounce my car. <laughs> yes. then, then he explained to me, you know, it's like that. Yes. So, and, and then another person told me their car was wrecked. I'm like, oh, no, uh-huh. what did you hit? I didn't hit anything. It was wrecked. Well, here in America, <laughs> you wreck a car. It's an accident. Uh, so so then, you know, after I was confused, he explained, oh, it was a, what do you Americans call it? Oh, it's a, a tow truck. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I took a while to catch on there. Yes, yes, yes. We do. Yeah, right. cars are wrecked. <laughs> Yeah, when a car is wrecked here, it's, it's an accident. Yeah. That's remarkable. We're speaking the same language and just the nuances and some of those words. All right, Floyd. So as you look back on your career, what are some of the proud moments that stand out for you? Proud moments. Um, I published a, my PhD dissertation was on the birds of Paraguay. So I was really happy when I, I published that book. And I normally have it here, but I took it home. Because I didn't want it to burn up if there was a fire here when I evacuated my home <laughs> a couple of years ago. Um, another one is I, I became a Fulbright scholar, scholar back in 2012 and uh, in Paraguay for four months. And, and that was a big highlight for me. It was nice to be able to go back to Paraguay. And I taught in a couple of I taught in a couple of universities there. And um, it felt really, really good to be able to go back to Paraguay and reconnect with some of my former colleagues and, and to get paid to do that and, and, uh, and to be able to lecture in Spanish and a couple of universities there, that felt really good. I'd say that was probably the, the, the highlight of my career. So Floyd, we've learned so much about you from the conversation we've had today, but tell me if there was something, what would we be hard pressed to guess about you that no one really knows? Tell us. Believe it or not, I used to work at the Central Intelligence Agency. My jaw is dropped. 
<laughs> now this calls for an entire different episode. <laughs> so you want to hear about it? Yes. I used to um, cut the grass and pull weeds in the garden there. Are you serious? What you did to the CIA? I did. So, okay. I spent, I think, about five different Sundays working there for uh, a company that, that was contracted to do the, the lawn work in the compound. And so I did that when I was in high school. And so I was not a spy. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> Pulling weeds? <laughs> you know, you never know. <laughs> It was fun. It was an interesting place because you drive along the highway in, in Virginia and there's an exit that goes off, but there was no sign for the exit. And then the whole entire compound was fenced with barbed wire and it had all these um, uh, some sort of vibration switches there. And the buildings all had uh, video cameras on the corners of them. In those days, video cameras were rare. I mean, you just didn't see them very often. And uh, one time my, my brother and I were mowing the lawn. And we bumped the fence. And uh, a, a minute or two later, suddenly a couple of police cars drove up, you know, with the sirens on and the lights shining. And we put our hands up in the air. And they said, uh, they suddenly realized what was happening. <laughs> they said, hey, can you guys tell your boss to let us know where you're mowing the lawn so we won't have to respond if you bump the fence? <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's a really funny story. So, oh, yeah. So you can say you've had your run in with the CIA. <laughs> and you're right. In those days, cameras were, of course, not as common as we see them these days. Because not many of us get the kind of broad range of experiences you've had across so many different countries and uh, um, things like that. Um, having done as much as you have, and for our audience out there, if any of you are interested, uh, Professor Floyd Hayes has a YouTube channel in which you can see some of his um, climbing experiences. I actually took a look at that one that you did with Matterhorn most scary for someone like me who's happy with a remote and a television very safe <laughs> doing that so with all of this so many things that you've done floyd anything remains on your bucket list that you'd like to do i know you mentioned you'd look forward to perhaps doing kilimanjaro but anything else um i want to visit the indian ocean so that's pretty high on my bucket list i want to go snorkeling there i mean snorkeling is one of my favorite activities um I'd love to visit Antarctica. I don't really foresee that ever happening because it's too expensive. I'd also love to hit uh, to visit Australia someday. I think that is much more likely than um, Antarctica, but it may have to wait until I'm retired. And um, so, yeah, when I retire, I hope I can be healthy enough and still alive and be, be able to visit more new countries I've never been to. Well, I'm certain that you will be having more adventures as you, like you say, beyond retirement and so on. All right. So one of the things we do on the wormhole is apart from um, understanding your career path and all that you do is that we have a couple of signature questions and I'm going to bounce them off you now. Um, do you have a favorite book or movie that perhaps is, you know, that you think everyone should take a read of? Well, if I were to say I had a favorite book, it would have to be the Bible. I saw that um, one coming. Yes. Yeah. In terms of a movie, it would uh, I'd really like the Titanic. I've always liked that one. The the music, the story, uh, the, the the shock and awe of watching what happens, even though it's a it's a, a fairy tale of what happened. You know, we know what what it's based on something that really did happen in real life. The ship sinking. Another movie I really like is called Hacksaw Ridge, and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that. So. When I was a kid, there was a there was a soldier named Desmond Doss, and I actually read a book about him. I've read it several times, and he was my my war hero. In fact, there was a time in life I wanted to be a soldier, but uh, not anymore. But anyway, that's uh, the story about this this um, uh, soldier who was a Seventh Day Adventist, and um, he was drafted in the military, and he did not want to take any lives, so he was a conscientious objector, and he wound up saving. Uh, hundreds of people uh, during World War II in the islands of the Pacific Ocean. And so this movie is is based on his life and it's very inspirational to me. Yeah, that definitely sounds very inspirational. And it's one that I have to now check it out. So definitely um, that kind it's of- It's brutal. The, the first half is really nice. The second half is very, very brutal. And it's probably realistic. I mean, war is hell. Yes. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's why if you there's any way that one could minimize the brutalness of war, as you say, I don't know. It's very sad. So, I mean, as a biologist, do you see these things as core to who we are? Could we ever get rid of war? You think? You know, I think human beings are on average, basically good people. When we have all that we need, when we don't have all we need, if we are starving, and, you know, it, uh, for example, hungry, thirsty, we get desperate. I think that war and politics is very similar. They tend to bring out the best and the worst, either the best or the worst in people. And some people, they bring out the absolute worst. In others, they bring out the best. And I've always wanted to think that if I were ever in a war situation, it would bring out the best in me. And I feel inspired about, you know, World War II stories about, about in Europe, how some of those people risked their lives and died trying to save Jews and uh, allied pilots. And uh, there's actually there's a book I really enjoy called Flee the Captor about one such gentleman that 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 saved you know thousands of people in in in, in uh, Europe during World War II and without killing anybody. And so I think that's something that we should all aspire is to have these, you know, events bring out the best in us and not the worst. And we're seeing that today with all these people helping the refugees fleeing from from yes. Ukraine. Yeah, absolutely very sobering. Um, and I'm now going to tell you a small story that my mom always tells us because we are from India and uh, she was there at the time of the riots in the 1940s and all that kind of stuff. And there was a lot of fighting going on between the Hindus and the Muslims. And my family was Muslims. And uh, um, it was their Hindu neighbors and friends that hid my parents and protected them in their homes from the onslaught. They were coming and they were burning the villages. And uh, I mean, I still get a chill down my spine when she tells me these stories that they lived through. So that aspect of humanity that you say that situations that bring out the best and the worst in us, we really have to hope for the good to overpower the evil. So I know what you mean, those kind of scenarios. I mean, it's through HSA, but it's my mom. So that's as close as it can get. That's an amazing story. And that's the way we should yeah. be. You know, love yeah. our enemies, love those who curse us, love our neighbors. Yeah, that's very inspiring. Very inspiring. I could go keep on listening to you on and on. <laughs> your philosophical aspect of things as well as your adventures. Going to ask you one last question, Floyd, before we close off. And it's again one of our signature questions. And I think it's uh, applicable given that you're so much of a um, nature person. If you could have been any animal magically, which one would you choose? You know, I thought about that. I was thinking maybe um, an animal like Zasu, the hornbill, because he was vegetarian. I'm vegetarian. Oh, yes. And he could fly around and look at all the different wildlife in Africa. That's what I would like to see. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Floyd. It has been an absolute pleasure meeting back with you, even though in this virtual mode. Um, and I have been absolutely found your conversation very engaging and a lot to be inspired by. So, uh, folks, this brings us to the end of another episode of The Wormhole. I am your host, Sharon Hack, signing off from none other than Studio 42, where we seek to find the answers to the questions of life, the universe, and everything. Okay, bye.